The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trap them. No person can deny. No person can deny. Hello, my name is Hugh Henry. This is Free Thought Forum. We have here uh, Ruth Lett from our organization, who is going to be the interviewee of Sally Cheesack, who is not Sally Cheesack today. She is Lucy Stone. And when I asked her who Lucy Stone is, she said, you'll find out when we do the interview. Lucy Stone apparently isn't with us anymore. This is called Lucy Stone, A Soul As Free As Air. So we take you back to another time and Ruth Lett, our intrepid reporter, in her trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to interview uh, Lucy Stone. But first, let me tell you a little bit about her. <clears throat> she achieved a number of firsts in her life. She was the first woman in Massachusetts to earn a college degree. She was the first woman in the U.S to keep her own name after marriage. And she was the first person in New England to be cremated. While she might not have been a full-fledged freethinker, she is certainly a notable woman who fought for human rights. Lucy, I feel it's indeed an honor to interview such a courageous and forward-looking woman. Tell us about your early years. Well, thank you for those kind remarks. Well, let me put it this way. If this August 13th I was still here, I'd be 187 years old. Why? Wow. <laughs> yes, I was born in August 13th, 1818, uh, on the family farm in um, Massachusetts. I was the, the eighth of nine children. As you can see, birth control wasn't an option at that time. Were your early years a happy time? No, not altogether. It just, I just think of it with sadness when I think of my father who ruled the household by divine right. And I can still remember my poor mother having to beg for every penny she, she want, wanted and needed from him. So that certainly didn't make me too happy. Is that the only thing that made you unhappy? Oh, no, not by all means. Now, I don't mean to be boastful, but I was better at learning than my brother, much better. Yet, he was going to be educated, and I was not. And the way that they covered it was they would preach to me from the Bible and tell me the diff why. In the Bible, it says that men and women were different, and how? So, for, uh, so I wasn't going to get to be educated, not with his money. Well, that doesn't seem fair. <clears throat> did you ever get to college? Yes, I did, but uh, my father didn't support that, so I had to uh, teach school, uh, you know, before I got to go to college which is kind of strange. Today, you'd have to have a college degree to teach school, right. but not in those days. What college did you attend? Well, I attended several. I even attended uh, Mount Holyoke Female Seminary. And, but, and all this time, you know, I was trying to save money, and by the time I was 25, I had enough money to go to Oberlin College. Wasn't that the first college to... Um admit both blacks and women? And yes, to both of that. Did you graduate from there? Um, y yes, I did. I, I spent four years at Oberlin. All the time I was teaching and doing housework to have the money to do this. And then I graduated in 1847. They even asked me to write a speech for the graduation, but I refused. Why? Wouldn't that have been an honor to give a speech? Yes, yeah, some honor. 
since women weren't allowed to speak in public, someone else would have had to read my speech. Whoa. Does that mean you were never able to speak in public? No, it doesn't. I gave my first public speech at my, uh, on women's rights, by the way, uh, at the pulpit of my brother's congregational church in Gardner, Massachusetts. Was that also your church? Until they expelled me. And they expelled me because I was speaking publicly. And also I was convinced that the Bible's prescription on women were badly translated. And I found these rules to be unfair to women. What made you so certain about that? Well, when my father wouldn't pay for my education, I decided to learn both Greek and uh, uh, Hebrew so that I would be able to correct the verses because I, I knew that they were wrong. Did you join any other church? Uh, the Unitarian Church. Oh, uh, let me say, tell you something else that was kind of funny. After I graduated from, they wouldn't let me speak when I graduated, but after I graduated from Oberlin, uh, 36 years later, they asked me to write the graduation speech for uh, their 50th anniversary. So that was kind of a funny situation. Yeah. Who, who read the speech? <laughs> At that time, women could read it. Ah. But see, that was 36 years after I graduated. Making a little progress by then. Very little. <clears throat> uh, weren't you also connected with the American Anti-Slavery Society? Uh, I was, uh, a year after I graduated, and they e it was even a paid position. And, and I traveled and I gave speeches on abolition and women's rights. William Lloyd Garrison, whose ideas were uh, dominant in the Anti-Slavery Society, said of Lucy, she is a very superior young woman and has a soul as free as the air and is preparing to go forth as a lecturer, particularly in vindication of rights of women. I like that for him saying that I'm just yeah. free as the air. Right. That's very nice of him. Wonderful. Um, I created a lot of controversy within the anti-slavery society, and they thought that maybe I was diminishing their efforts on behalf of, of uh, their abolition cause. Did they fire you? Uh, no, no, they didn't. I arranged to uh, separate the, the two ventures, speaking on uh, weekends on abolition, and then during the week uh, I, I, I spoke on women's rights. I also charged a little admission, and believe it or not, I'm in just... Um, Three years, I made $7,000, which was a lot of money then. Boy. But weren't you also in some kind of danger when you were doing that? Well, if you call danger them throwing their prayer books at me and other missiles. <laughs> and not only that, their hostility was so, of the crowds was so bad that they even put um, uh, burned pepper. They burned pepper in the auditorium, and of course they tore down all the posters and mm. advertising my talks. But didn't you also experience that sort of hostility? Yes, um, even in the 20th century, our posters advertising free thinkers meetings inside San Antonio College were torn down. Well, so some things never change, unfortunately. That's true, I cause uneasiness in the spirit of sectarianism in the institution, and I guess you, do, you did too at San Antonio College. I guess so. Were you involved in the 1848 convention in Seneca Falls? Well, that convention was very important, but um, you know, mostly the people that attended were from the locals. They were from that local area. So I was involved in the next step, which was in 1850 when I was a leader in organizing the first National Women's Rights Convention in Massachusetts. Did you ever meet Susan B. Anthony? Meet her? Why, my speech is credited with converting Susan B. Anthony to the cause of women's suffrage. I also convinced Julia Ward 
how to adopt the woman's rights as a cause, along with abolition, which she was interested in. You know who she is. She she uh, uh, she's the, the the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which that immortalized her name. Right. Well, tell us about your marriage. Oh dear. <laughs> in 1853, I met Cincinnati businessman Henry Blackwell. Uh, and I met him on one of my speaking tours. Now, the reason I say, oh dear, was because I was a little hesitant about that since he was seven years younger than I. But he courted me, and what really, he courted me for two years. And what really impressed me was when he saved, he rescued this fugitive a slave from its owner. At this time, the fugitive slave law required residents of non-slave-holding states to return escaped slaves to their owners. This brought many anti-slavery citizens to break the law as often as they could. That's true. But Henry was not only anti-slavery, he was also pro-woman rights. And even though I was impressed with Henry, I wrote him and said this. Let me read it to you. A wife should no more take her husband's name than he should take hers. My name is my identity and must not be lost. Uh, he agreed with Lucy and wrote back, I wish as a husband to renounce all the privileges which the law confers upon me, which are not strictly mutual. Surely, such a marriage will not degrade you, dearest Lucy. With that, we married in 1855. The minister, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, read a statement by the bride and groom renouncing and protesting the marriage laws at the time and announcing that I would keep my name. Higginson. Was he the same Higginson known for his uh, connection to Emily Dickinson? Yeah, the very same. Uh, were any children born of your marriage? Uh, yes, I had two children. My first one, a son, died at birth. My daughter was named Alice Stone Blackwell. I retired from public speaking for the years when I had my, my child so that I could devote my time to being a mother, which is not a trivial job either. Did that mean that you no longer had any controversy in your life? No, not at all. We moved from Cincinnati to New Jersey, and the following year, I refused to pay my taxes. Now, Henry and I had made sure that my property and my income was all in my name. I protested the taxes as taxation without representation, since they did not allow women to vote. Well, surely the authorities didn't let you get away with that. Well, they did see some of my furniture, but really it was most symbolic, really. How long did you remain inactive then? Uh, both my husband and I were inactive until after the Civil War and the 14th Amendment was proposed, giving the vote to black men. That was the first time that the Constitution would mention uh, male citizens explicitly, wasn't it? Yes, and that outraged most women suffrage activists, and they saw this amendment as setting the cause of women suffrage back. In 1867, I went on a full lecture tour to Kansas and New York trying to work for both black and women suffrage. Didn't others help at that time? Well, unfortunately, at that time, the movement sort of split on this and other strategic grounds. Uh, the National Woman Suffrage Association, led by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, decided to oppose the 14th Amendment because of the language male citizen. Julia Ward Howe, Henry, and I let those who sought to keep the causes of black and woman suffrage together, and so we founded uh, the American Woman Suffrage Association. How did this affect your home life? Didn't you say that uh, 
to you being a mother was not a trivial thing. Well, that's right. And I do think that a woman belongs with a husband and children, of course, having all the freedom, personal freedom and large freedom, the right to vote, all the freedoms. So, but I started a suffrage, a suffrage uh, weekly newspaper called The Woman's Journal. And working on newspaper gave me a lot of time to be at home also. So that's very uh, compatible with family life compared to the lecture circuit when you're out all the time. So you had it all. Your daughter, Alice, attended Boston University where she was one of two women in a class of 26 men. And later she was involved with the Women's Journal, which you had started, which survived until 1917. Well, not entirely. My radical move to keep my own name both continued to inspire women, but it didn't rage some. Uh, in 1879, Massachusetts gave a limited uh, right of women to vote as we could vote for school committees. In Boston, registrars refused to let me vote unless I used my husband's name. And even in hotels, when I signed my name, I had to also put, I had to sign this way, Lucy Stone married to Henry Blackwell for my signature to be accepted. For all her radical reputation, Lucy maintained a Republican Party line, opposing, for instance, labor movement organizing and strikes, and Victoria Woodhull's radicalism. That lady's life requires a full program, but we'll have to leave Victoria Woodhull for another day. Lucy died in 1893. She is less known than Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but she really shouldn't be. Thank you very much. I would like to add something that not many people know, and that is that the Civil Rights Act of 1960, the discrimination, the part about discrimination against women, was put in there as a poison pill by the opponents in hopes that it would defeat the bill. It was not put there by the proponents of the bill, so it only came in as a side effect. This is in yeah. 1960, not that long ago, and I can remember it. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, even today, uh, a lot of women who change their name, they still get a little flack from their, uh, you know, their friends and from from their uh, uh, family. And I know because in my family, uh, one of my nephews was was saying to me, uh, "Well, I don't know why." Uh, so and so, I'm not going to mention names. So and so didn't change her name to his name. If she loved him, she would. And I said, well, and if he loved her, why didn't he change his name to hers? <laughs> so <laughs> it's still going on. I right. also, I also must believe that Lucy Stone was very widely traveled because I detect no hint of a New England accent. In fact, it seems a bit Texan to me. <laughs> Well, I don't know why that is, <laughs> partner. <laughs> I don't know why. Well. So the women's movement, like most movements, split, recombine, split and recombine, and we're seeing the same thing here in the abolitionist movement, splitting and recombining over various issues. I know that the women's movement um, had lots of problems with, you know, as, as uh, Jesse uh, Jackson would say, keep the eye on the prize. And in many cases, people like Lucy in the abolitionist movement would have been accused of not keeping the eye on the prize. Exactly. You're splitting our efforts, and it's hard enough to get this done as it is. Yes, but don't you think that churches do the same thing? You know, if, if you belong to a certain church and, and they do something or they advocate something that you don't like, well, you just split off and take people with you and... Start no, you church. think so? <laughs> <laughs> it may even happen in fact. Who knows? <laughs> Close to happening, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Oh dear. Well, the uh, the lady that actually nobody wanted on their team was um, uh, uh, Victoria Woodhall, and neither uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Anthony wanted her, and neither did Lucy Stone. <laughs> and of course, she was really before her time. She really believed in free love, and she was really radical. Yeah, she was, and uh, also she was a a fortune teller. And, but it, you know, she had a dysfunctional family, and so when her father asked her and her sister to go out and read fortunes for a nickel or whatever, well, they did that, and then they just continued doing that. And uh, uh, so, you know, maybe certainly maybe. these ladies thought they were too good for her. Good heavens. For as poor this, old Victoria. As the song goes, gypsies, tramps, and, sheets, uh, uh, and thieves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Cher, I see you listen to Cher. Yeah. But how, what do I know? I've been dead 187. <laughs> <laughs> well, wherever you're parked, heaven or hell, you did acquire that Texas accent. So. <laughs> must be hell. Well traveled. <laughs> must must be hell, I would suspect, <laughs> based on that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably lots of Texans there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Boy, that's going to get me in trouble with Texans, <laughs> gypsies, yeah, who else? <laughs> well, get the rope. <laughs> New York City. <laughs> get the rope. <laughs> um, let's get back to, to Lucy Stone. Um, why do you think it is that, that we have Susan B. Anthony dollars, which are quite useless because they're the same size as a quarter, and Sacagawea doctors, dollars, which are also quite useless because they're the same size as a dollar. Are we going to have a Lucy Stone dollar that's just as bad? <laughs> I bet you hardly anyone has ever heard I've of never Lucy heard Stone. Of her. Why is that? Well, she, yeah. I, I guess she just wasn't... Um, Didn't have good press. Right, <laughs> yeah. And I, and I suppose when she was gone all those years, she probably was out of the limelight and they just forget her. But then there's a lot of uh, women that helped out with the... Uh, uh, movement that didn't get their due, but mostly right. just, uh, that's the way it happens in everything. Right. Well, one possibility is prejudice by the historians who are covering it, exactly. many of whom would be woman. women. Would there, there be a reason for a prejudice against covering Lucy? Uh, maybe. Maybe they didn't like her changing her name either. I bet you that had a lot to do with, with people, you know, throwing their prayer books at her. Uh, just because she changed her name. And and I don't think that that's a, you know, an easy subject even today. Okay, well let me, being an atheist, I get suspicious in a hurry. Let's see. Susan B. Anthony, was she pretty much Christian? Uh, no, I don't think she was. She, I think she, she was, um, prob maybe she started out agnostic even. Hmm. But, but she wasn't, I've never read that she was Christian, and she said a lot of things that led you to believe she wasn't, hmm. or at least that she had come to find out that there wasn't all that, you know, we think it is when they, we first start being brainwashed. Gee, I wonder why Lucy Stone didn't, didn't get the coverage and Susan B. did. Oh, well. Um, we're talking about this period in history uh, when these changes took place, and all these women that made these changes... What do you think sparked that? Anything in particular? Why then? Why not later or earlier? Well, I, no, I, I wouldn't know why at that particular time. Maybe they just got fed up. And, you know, that as, as happens, you know, you take, you take, you take, and then finally something happens, you get fed up. Were the laws against women, and, you know, the laws that said their property and so forth, their cattle and so forth, were they particularly in effect during the 19th century sort of thing, more than at other times? Well, even, in, even in Texas, yeah. But even in Texas, uh, when uh, in the 60s and before the 50s, and all, a woman didn't have a right to get a credit card on her own. And if you had property, uh, you would, or if you tried to borrow the money, your husband would have to sign for you. It's, it's not... Oh, and it's, we're talking not, about... We're not talking about long... That wasn't long, long time. We're not talking about the 1860s, lady. We're talking about the 1960s. Right. The 1960s is what I'm talking Good about. Good heavens. Yes. <laughs> and even uh, be, being members of the grand jury. That didn't happen until just, you know, 
recent times. Wow. Yeah, so it's not... Uh, we have had a long struggle, and this is another thing that Lucy says, is that the, the rights that we enjoy today, that young women enjoy today, uh, that we've, they, have, they fought so hard for them, and the women today don't know that. They don't even know anything about these women. Not too many people even know about uh, 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 Stanton. What? Elizabeth Katie Stanton. Elizabeth Katie Stanton. They don't even know about her. They have heard of uh, Aunt Anthony. Susan B. Yeah. Anthony. Yeah, well, they have heard of her, but they haven't. They don't really know, and they don't care. They just, you know, don't vote. And I was going to say, uh, today's voter wouldn't necessarily care that much about getting the right to vote, but you better believe today's Texas women would be seriously upset about not being able to get a credit card. Oh, right. <laughs> Yes, we will fight them. to the death for that. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't even know that wasn't true 40 years ago. That's right. Probably not. No, they don't. They okay. accept everything that it's always been this way. My God, 60s, that was 40 years ago? <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, <laughs> mere babes at that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> then you weren't either. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. Well, especially if you're 187 years old, I have to bow to you in a hurry. I know. It's it hard to walk. Even. <laughs> well, uh, of course, you probably weren't that interested in women's suffrage either when you were a young man. And well, you're still a young man in my eyes, anyway. But what I'm saying is, but you would think that women would have would know more about it because of the uh, restrictions that we had. Well, look at even today. Have we had a woman's president in America? That's not that we don't have one because women don't trust women. <laughs> she's going to hit me for that. I am. I'm tied up right now. But she's going. She's going to hit. Me. She hits hard too. <laughs> wait till I get loose. <laughs> I was in a school barn for nothing. <laughs> um, let's see. Where were we? Well. People only know what they got now and what they want. They don't care about how they got it. Exactly. Right. Right. And I got what I want, and I want this more. And who's going to give it to me? And what they don't realize is that we could even lose it. Look at the abortion right movement. Okay, so it's the law, but they have been chipping away at it uh, so that eventually I don't think abortions will be uh, available. And that was a Texas case, too. Yeah. Roe v. Wade. Wade was the the uh, Attorney General of Texas. I do believe. Who? Wade Roe v. Wade. Wade was the Attorney General of Texas. A woman. No. No. Roe is no you're, are you thinking? The case Roe v. Wade. Yeah, Roe okay. was the anonymous woman. Right, right, right. Wade, I believe, was the Attorney General of Texas oh, at the oh, time. Okay. I thought I, we were, I was thinking of her. No, no. She went under the. That was Jane. Uh, Jane, Jane Roe. Roe, and because then later they didn't want to use her name. Right. She she turned cold late after that. <laughs> right. <laughs> after that, but um, that was interesting too because the uh, the lady that argued the case was uh, 26 years old. Wow. And Sarah Weddington. That's and she had she had Ann Richards, who later would become the governor of Texas, working for her. That was a while ago. <laughs> that was quite a while yes. ago. Well, thank you very much, Lucy Stone. You're welcome. Or Sally Cheezak, <laughs> or whomever, even though you're going to hit me later. I, I, I don't forget. I know she doesn't. <laughs> uh, it's, been, it's been very interesting learning about Lucy Stone, and it's very interesting learning from you two. This has been Free Thought Forum. This is Hugh Henry. Please drop in again. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to duke or dictator. No person can deny, Deacon Duncan, Sin Fry. No 